Yes, I know what I said about another sci-fi series, but you know... But this wasn't the mission. The missions change. They always do. Forever ago, I heard music from the soundtrack of the sequel to this game, and I enjoyed it immensely, but I never actually got around to playing either of them until now. Of course, trying to find content about it is problematic because, well, you try typing the words obscure video game and see what happens. So I'm sure this video will do extremely well long term. And before we go anywhere, if you want to try this game, I beg of you to please lower your computer volume before you open it. There is no volume slider in the options, and it nearly blew my eardrums out. Anyway, the game feels very much in the vein of Silent Hill and Resident Evil, with a mundane location rendered far more sinister. The fixed camera angles positioned as if it's the POV of some creature watching you scurry around the school, and the combat where moving while firing is not an impossibility, but definitely isn't going to get you anywhere fast. It's not horrendous, but the jank is absolutely there, and playing solely with the keyboard and no mouse to aim at things properly was not a welcome experience for someone who's far more used to modern games these days. The controls themselves are a little funky, with no real inventory screen to speak of, and just scrolling lists of items for you to awkwardly swap to as needed. If you can get around that awkwardness, however, are there some stellar spooks waiting for you in this early aughts horror game? <laughs> well... If you enjoy this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and drop a comment telling me your experience with the game. We begin our story by being smashed in the face with early 2000s teen rebellion music and horrendous compression as we're introduced to a few of the main cast during basketball practice. Namely, Kenny, the jock, Josh, the film nerd, Stan, the weed guy, you can tell from his beanie, and Shannon, Kenny's sister. There's also Ashley, Kenny's girlfriend, but she isn't here yet. Shannon complains that it's late and that Kenny said he'd be home after practice, and there's a weird exchange about how he said that to their parents, but they've also gotten rid of their parents? I can only assume a holiday because this doesn't come up again, at least not where I could see it. She leaves after Kenny blows her off because he wants to go over to his girlfriend's house, and Josh tries his luck with Shannon, but she brushes him off and the rest of the team hits the showers. Kenny shoots a few more hoops and goes to the locker room where his team has just fucking vanished, and when he answers his phone to talk to Ashley, he turns his back and an unknown figure steals his bag. Giving chase, Kenny follows this mystery person out of the creepy showers, through the creepy courtyard, and into the creepy gardens where a creepy abandoned building sits waiting for him creepily. He steps inside, finds a ladder going into the basement, whereupon he hears something unfriendly. Now, instead of saying f the bag and leaving because he has a date with his girlfriend and he is a normal school kid, he grabs a gun that was just lying around in this abandoned building and tapes a flashlight to it, as you do. I assume this is normal behaviour for Americans. Descending beneath the building, he finds weird growths, dark clouds that he can burn away with a flashlight because apparently this random flashlight he found in the school's creepiest old building has an intensity slider that runs the risk of burning out the bulb, but at least I'm not running around searching for goddamn batteries, right, Alan? Passing through a room filled with empty cages and other serial killer detritus, Kenny eventually finds another student who seems to be in the final stages of transforming into a Morlock. The freed student acts as player two if you were to somehow convince someone else to play this nightmare with you. They attempt to leave, only to be stopped by whatever in sweet f***ing Christ that thing is, because unfortunately for Kenny, this is a section you're supposed to fail at. He and the student are struck down and dragged away, completing the prologue. Shannon talks to an angry Ashley outside the school and finds out that Kenny didn't make it to his date, but because he didn't go home either, both of them worry something happened to him. As everyone filters into the school, the headmaster gets some extremely subtle evil vibes. Yes, take advantage of the sunshine while it lasts. The girls conspire with film nerd to investigate where Kenny might have gone and end up locked in the school after hours like the absolute brain geniuses they are. After picking up a leftover baseball bat and vandalizing the nearby vending machines for that sweet, sweet caffeine, the gang breaks some more doors, picks some more locks, before hearing... something moving around upstairs. Unlocking the door to that something, the gang is attacked by small fleshy creatures that reminded me of the horrible monsters from that hideous murder house in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. You know, those fleshy, geodude-looking abominations that haunt my nightmares. Those things. Before they can get a good munch of sweet film nerd flesh, an adult rushes in to break the window and explain the creatures are weak to light, which is a shame because it's past 6pm and there isn't much of that left. The adult, Mr. Walden, refuses to explain anything else and just unlocks the door to the courtyard. Sweet. Over in the classrooms, the gang finds Stan messing around with his grades on a teacher's computer, completely oblivious to the fact that there are monsters around or even that Kenny is missing, despite the fact that all three of these losers have had all day to inform him that his friend is missing. He also talks like this. 
Whoa, dog. I don't know what you've been smoking, but you need to stop. But don't tell me you didn't see anything. You didn't notice anything bizarre? Yeah, everything I see up in this piece is whack. Which is definitely a choice. After fighting their way through rooms, halls, and nearly getting flattened by a much bigger monster that clearly came from underground, Josh puts some sulfuric acid in a paper cup and uses it to reach the second floor. These kids are going places. Namely the f***ing grave at this rate. There's a note about mortophilia that explains some of what's going on, specifically why there's black mold everywhere and why it and the monsters recede from light. It's some kind of plant from Africa that works nothing like a plant should and is aggressively parasitic. So it's basically like cordyceps before it was cool. Investigating the headmaster's office, we hear there's trouble in the infirmary with Miss Wixon, who seems to be in on what's happening behind the scenes. We also learn that the headmaster had a twin brother, and that both of them are old as bulls because they were born in the 19th century and don't remotely look like it. Hmm. After solving two puzzles to get keys for the library, the kids confront Headmaster Friedman, only to be brushed off and told to get the f*** out. An old paper in the library reveals that Friedman's brother, Leonard, was lost in a plane crash, but that his body was never found. Hmm. The kids are specifically instructed to go find the janitor to let them out, and night falls, getting rid of that ever so handy daylight. We return to the courtyard and- You guys sure took your time. What do we do now? Something's collapsed! The game tries to give me a goddamn heart attack by breaking the admin building. Alright then. The gang find the janitor has been recently mauled to death, and after investigating the security feeds, realize that Miss Wixon is in trouble and needs help. As if that couldn't be ascertained from the phone message in Friedman's office, but you could have missed that. Before leaving, they review a couple of tape recordings that show what happened the night Kenny disappeared, where to find him, and how the monsters got loose. Heading over to the infirmary and fighting through an offensive amount of bullshit, the gang make it to Miss Wixon crying for help on the other side of the door, and... Who is it? I'm not opening up until the lights are back on. Lady, are you kidding me? Once the lights are working, which don't really do all that much to make the school feel less oppressive, the kids talk to Wixon. The nurse is clearly overwhelmed by the situation and rambles about how someone called Leonard wants to get out. Hmm. The kids brush off her rambling as having lost her mind and leave rather than try to understand what she was saying. Like I said, these kids are going places. Returning to admin, the kids retrieve a reel of film from the archives that leads them over to the amphitheater. They run into Walden again, who seems a little bit more erratic than before, but still himself. He gives the kids a key to the basement they'll find Kenny in, and once more abandons them. At this point, I remember that you can press F to switch between characters, and I could have been playing a girl this entire time. At the amphitheater, the kids take a moment to actually pay attention to the pictures hanging in the hall and realize immediately that the headmaster hasn't aged at all. You'd think literally anyone else might have noticed this, like another adult, perhaps, but okay. The film reel shows experiments done with the mortophilia, and also shows someone who looks a lot like the headmaster injecting himself, only for him to face the camera and look very much worse off for it. Moving the service elevator out of the way so the gang can reach the basement brings us to a surprise boss fight with this thing, after which the kids descend, only to be almost crushed by the elevator. So much for that goddamn safety pin. Once everyone is in the basement, I realize once again that I can just swap Josh out too, and I promptly turn this little adventure into the world's worst girl night. After fighting through dismal hallways littered with twisted experiments and filled with the screams of their tortured classmates, the girls find Kenny only to be gassed by Friedman. Calm it's down. Friedman! Waking up to find the whole gang was captured, Kenny informs them that they're all infected courtesy of the headmaster and they have until sunrise to find a solution. They escape because someone thought it was a great idea to leave a very long stick with a hook on the end in Shannon's cell and emerge blinking into the night. Returning to Miss Wixon, the gang find her dying, mauled by something, presumably the creatures. She tells them there's an antidote in the underground labs if they enter through the gardens and pieces out. Unable to use the side gate, the girls pass through the old dorms that were shut down after too many students went missing and find themselves bombarded with creepy reversed audio and abysmal amount of enemies and Dutch angles. This is also the point where the girls' night from hell almost came to an abrupt end because I forgot there was a walk button to get over some weak flooring. Oops. Loading a previous save, the girls flawlessly cross the danger zone and acquire both a map of the basement, a key to the library door Friedman escaped through last time he was there, and the janitor's logbook. 
The janitor details his findings connecting 26 missing persons cases to the school and the fact that Herbert Friedman, Leonard, and Wixon are all over 100 years old. The most important part is that the brothers went on an expedition to Africa, doesn't specify where, on a giant continent made up of many countries, and that they've been running experiments to create an anti-aging serum from the mortophilia plant they brought back. Which has gone swimmingly, as we can see. Opening Friedman's playroom, the gang retrieve one of the statues they'll need for later in another reel of film. They're stopped from leaving by Walden, but talk of an antidote sets him off, stealing the map of the basement and locking the door behind him. I think Walden might be losing it a little. I'm just getting that vibe. The girls make their way out of the library, get the code from the film reel to open the garden gates, and retrieve the rest of the creepy little statues as they go. They have a brief moment of peace with one of the monsters who just wants to play red light, green light and chill out. Look at their face. He just wants some friends. The gang finds the same ladder- <laughs> The gang finds the same ladder Kenny descended at the start of the game and head down to confront this mess at its source. Beating a third maggot monster boss, they place the statues on the pillars of the mystery machine and pull the lever, where the scene switches to Walden at a massive spooky door that opens because of the gang shenanigans. They catch up just in time for him to confront Friedman on the other side, shooting him dead to get the antidote despite Friedman telling him that it won't work because he's too far gone. Walden is promptly killed by a huge monster with Friedman's face on it and oh, oh right, Leonard. There's his missing brother. Yes, it turns out Leonard has been under the school this entire time because their experiments went poorly for him. Herbert and Wixon were trying to find a way to reverse his transformation using the students as lab rats, but all that has come crashing down. At the sight of his brother's dead body, Leonard flies into a rage, prompting a boss fight where the gang brings down the ceiling and exposes Leonard to the light. The second stage of the fight takes place in the gymnasium where the game began, now ruined and flooded with sunlight, and despite Leonard's best efforts, he eventually disintegrates under the morning sunrise. The kids finally get their antidote, having all survived a horrific ordeal, and the game closes with daylight shots of the school's empty rooms. Only for one last f**k you in the form of a shadow falling over Stan and a monstrous cry before smash to credits. Well, there is a sequel, so they weren't completely full of it. For as much early aughts cheese this game shoves down your throat, I did find myself enjoying its absurdity, and from what I've seen, the second game goes even harder, so we have this, but even more to look forward to. I think what surprised me the most was the musical choice. The over-the-top, creepy choir singing and orchestral strings didn't feel quite right. For a cheesy, awkward teen horror story about plant-based body horror, the music would feel more at home for a supernatural cult threat. But maybe that's just me. Either way, I'll see you next week for the sequel, and we'll see just how much harder it went. I can't believe it took me until the end of the game to realize Josh is voiced by Sam Regal. It's not like I'm a fan of Critical Role or anything. Oh, wait.